the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. This gospel reading is a well-known story. You may have even heard it referenced in a clergy joke or two. Knowing the story as a historical event and miracle is important. However, knowing the deeper theological implications of this story is also an important way of knowing the story. According to the Gospel of John, very early in the ministry of Jesus, on the third day, Jesus and his disciples left Bethany and went to Cana of Galilee for a wedding. God's glory would also be revealed by his son on the third day after his crucifixion and resurrection. Weddings during the time of Jesus were a big deal. Sometimes lasting an entire week, festivities included a procession in which the bridegroom's friends brought the bride to the groom's house for the wedding feast. A steward, our friend, would supervise the feast. Nuptial festivities were commonly known to be drink festivals in keeping with the rabbinic dictum, where there is no wine, there is no joy. Wine, and lots of it, were an integral and important part of the festivities. Just as many continue to do in our day and time, couples would go to great lengths and expense in order to not risk being embarrassed or shamed by running out of food or drink at the wedding reception. Culture in first century Palestine was one of shame and honor. Honor and shame were important because they helped define one's status within the community. To be honored was to be special and important. To be dishonored or diminished in status was to be shamed or carry the burden of public scorn. Honor is hard to acquire and easy to lose. Once lost honor can be very difficult to regain if that is even possible once one has been dishonored. We don't know Mary's connection to the bride or groom. However, it seems reasonable to assume that she was either a family friend or extended family member because of the way she took responsibility for the problem. To her son, she said, they have no wine, implying this was somehow Jesus' problem to fix on her behalf. The exchange then that followed between Mary and Jesus has puzzled theologians for centuries. As it says in the Ten Commandments, Jesus honored his mother, and so he would never have done anything to be disrespectful to her. When Jesus answered, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? my hour has not yet come, he may have been saying, my concerns are not in this world, but the next. I am here to do the Father's will and bring people into relationship with him. We simply don't know for certain what Jesus was saying to his mother. Have you ever thought about times when we've been like Mary? You know, those times when we pray extra hard for Jesus to use his supernatural power to change things to the way that we want them to be? Have you ever asked him to answer a need that you know could only be answered by a miracle? Maybe you've prayed for someone at risk of dying from cancer or COVID or someone with some other devastating illness. Maybe it was for a job, a promotion, or for an important relationship to be restored. I'm sure that there have been no shortage of people who've asked God to help them with things such as asking them to win the lottery. With football playoffs yesterday and coming up, I'm sure that there are people who've prayed for the Bills, the Packers, or their team to get to the Super Bowl. In the case of the wedding in Cana, 
Mary told the servants, do whatever he tells you. She must have had confidence that Jesus could do something and that something would be consistent with the will of the Father. That, coincidentally, brings us to another significant insight into the gospel that could go unnoticed about the six stone jars. The six stone jars were set aside for the rites of purification, with each holding between 20 and 30 gallons of water. Stone vessels were commonly used in Judea for ritual purposes. According to the law of Moses, unlike the more porous clay commonly used in ancient times, stone was much less porous and would not become impure. Running water or living water was considered pure, and so collection of water in a stone cistern was often used for purification purposes. Living water, stored in a large stone water jar, functioned much like a cistern of ritually clean water reserved for the rites of purification. While the use of stone vessels is not implicit from the Hebrew Bible, sources in the Mishnah describe their use as being common practice during the Roman period. During the first centuries B.C. and A.D., the use of stone vessels was common in Judea and Galilee. Stone vessels were made from a soft limestone that was readily available throughout the region and easy to carve. As you can see from the pictures, the craftsmanship of the vessels varies widely by hand or in a lathe, from crude and uneven to perfectly uniform with incise decoration. A few even contain inscriptions such as a personal name or a chant. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. After the servants filled the stone vessels, he told them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. When the wine was taken to the steward, he said, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Through this miraculous event, God was glorified, providing a foretaste of the heavenly banquet with the Lamb. Through this event, the epiphany of Jesus as the bridegroom and his church first became known. They have no wine, and you have kept the best wine until last, are metaphors for what is happening and what is to come. The phrase, they have no wine, could be a metaphor for a Judaism that had lost its way. And you have kept the best wine until last could represent the fact that Judaism was now being renewed and replaced by the arrival of Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. The old wine in old wineskins was being replaced by the new wine of the church. The abundance of wine is indicative of the abundance of God's grace in contrast to the limitations of living strictly under the law of the old covenant. The magnificence of the gift is indicative of the arrival of Messiah. Psalm 85, 12 reads, The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. God's grace Mercy and love is abundant. The wedding feast at Cana provides a foretaste of that messianic heavenly banquet where those who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives and live according to his teachings will sit in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, feasting forever in his presence. John calls this event a sign instead of what we might otherwise call a miracle. A sign points our attention toward something. This sign points to Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. The last line of our gospel reading says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. 
I find it interesting that the two elements that are the focus of this gospel reading are water and wine. When it is through the water of baptism that we are made members of the body of Christ. And it is through wine that in some mysterious way known to God alone, the sacrament of the blood of Christ becomes known to us in communion. May you be illumined by God's word and sacraments so that your lives may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory here in Clifton Park and to the ends of the earth. Amen. <laughs>